Good. Well, we're running on a B crew today. Pastor and them are all out on vacation. And uh, as you can tell, we're trying to work with what we got. So, uh, let me do a little bit of announcements for start. Looks like uh, here soon we're going to have Vacation Bible School on July 17th to the 21st. Um, of course, we're going to have men's Bible study come next Saturday, this next coming Saturday, Wednesday night meetings. and uh, So Saturday, June 25th, will be work day at 9 a.m., and then Sunday, 26th, we'll have our carry-in dinner following the 11 o'clock service. I don't think there's any other announcements needing to be made right now. So with that, I'm going to have Bruce come and lead us in some songs. seated. Open up your Bibles with me, if you would please, to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. And we're going to be starting in verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. But he answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when the, will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed, 
For this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see the abomination of the desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as not has been from the very beginning of the world until now, no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So, if they say to you, look, He's in the wilderness. Do not go out. If they say, look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. In verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again just for an amazing, beautiful day, Lord, that we can gather here under one roof as one body in Christ. And Father, just listen to your word, Father. God, I, as we read this passage, and Lord, as you're speaking into my heart, Father, I pray that you will, Lord, challenge us today. Help us to look towards you, Father, in all things. And may your name be glorified now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Our scripture here is kind of a very harrowing one for some people. See, the disciples, they ask Jesus. They come to him in verse 3 as he's sitting there on the Mount of Olives. Tell us when will these things be. See, they're wanting to know, when is this temple going to be destroyed? He just mentioned when the temple was going to be destroyed. He said, this temple is going to be destroyed. So they want to know, when is this going to be? But there's two other questions they ask. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And as we just read, Christ goes into great, great detail of what it's going to look like. As we continue further into Scripture, Jesus begins to tell the disciples that there's going to be great calamities, wars, rumors of wars, that all of these are just birth pains. It's not yet the time in which He comes. He goes further in describing how there will be great trouble, and yet He still says that is not yet the time in which he comes. It's not until verse 29 that we find 
where we find his coming. It says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall, fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Today, I want to talk about his second coming. Today, because I, I feel in our hearts as Christians, and I, I'm speaking mostly, I guess, about me today, because as I was reading and, and going through Scripture and, and asking God, what should I preach on today? As always, he challenges my heart, and I just like to share it. My heart was challenged in the fact that how many times am I so caught up here, but I'm not looking towards his coming again. I'm so caught up on what I see Jesus in Scripture and what I've seen him as a man, but I don't see the great coming that is to, to be here soon. So today I want to talk about a simple question. Would we recognize Jesus? Would we recognize his return? Well, let's find out. We find right here in our scripture a contrast, and I like to contrast today from when he first came versus the second coming. When Jesus came the first time, it was in relative secrecy. See, when Christ had come to earth as a baby, Joseph wasn't willing to put Mary out because it did not seem that Mary and Joseph were married at the time. And in fact, if we continue to go through the story of Jesus' birth, not a lot of people knew that he was going to be born. In fact, it took people who were actually searching for him, the very few people, to try to find him. He was born in secrecy, in a manger. The second coming, however, will be impossible to ignore. Matthew 24, again, Starting in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. If you hold your finger there and you want to follow along with me, I'm going to flip back and forth between Matthew 24 and Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to be in verse 12. When he opened, this being Jesus, the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place where we find in contrast of jesus first coming he came as a baby as a manger in re relative secrecy but the second coming is going to be impossible to ignore because the universe itself will be shaken see when the king of kings and lord of lords returns to earth it's not going to be in a humble beginning no this is him coming as christ the king and the universe itself, as we read in Scripture, will be shaken and moved. What an awesome, awesome, unimaginable thing. This will be a time that has never happened before. This almost reminds me when just a, a small glimpse of what we see when Jesus is on the boat with the disciples. And he says, peace, be still. And the winds and the waves obey him. This is not just winds and waves. This is the very stars of heaven. How amazing is this? Can we even fathom for a moment what that's going to be like? To be on earth? Even in heaven to watch and see as everything, all of creation groans. And that's what we're finding here. 
as if you go back and in Revelation chapter 5, it says that everything will shout his glory. Everything will. And that is what we are seeing, that creation itself will be shaken. Creation itself will announce the coming. It will be impossible to ignore. Going back to Matthew 24. The first coming was only announced by, or to a select few. The second coming, however, will be announced to the whole world. If it wasn't enough that the entire universe is about to be shaken, follow along with uh, me to Matthew in chapter 24. I'm going to start in verse 27 here. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Go to verse 30. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Let's compare this. Go to Revelation chapter 6, starting in verse 15. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us! Hide us from the face of Him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And who can stand? It says everyone, slave and free, rich and powerful, poor, will see the coming. Contrast this with what we find with Jesus' birth in Luke chapter 2. I'll read it for you. In verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. Notice one angel. And they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And there suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. Notice that at the beginning, Jesus' birth, the King of kings, Lord of lords, being brought to us here on earth, the Savior of the world, was only announced to these shepherds. He was only announced to shepherds. A multitude even arrived to tell them this, but only to shepherds. And let's contrast this to what our text says. The whole earth the entire earth. Again, if it wasn't enough that the entire universe is now announcing this, the entire earth, it'll be unavoidable. The entire earth will see and hear the announcement of His coming. In verse 27, again in Matthew 24, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Meaning, it doesn't matter what part of the earth you're going to be on. It doesn't matter where you're going to be standing. It doesn't matter where you might be hiding. God is coming, and you will know it. Again, when he comes, the earth and the universe will be shaken, and you will see him. It's not just talking about you'll know because of all of these things happening around you at the time of him. That's just the announcement. This is seeing him himself. Again, the men the people of earth will mourn. The tribes will begin to mourn. Go to Revelation. Why? It says they hide their faces. They want to hide their faces. They see that whatever is coming and they know and they bow the knee at that time because they all of a sudden, it seems to me, that everybody who doesn't believe all of a sudden understands really 
really clear who it is that's coming. Today we talk, and you might witness to people, and I've, I've had people I've encountered so many times, and my heart breaks for them, and, I, and so many people that I had friends with, where you talk with them, and they refuse to believe. They refuse to believe. And my heart weeps every single time. And it just, when you read the scripture, it's like, do you not see what's going to happen? One day you will bow. One day you will see. Whether you're alive or you're dead, you're going to know. Oh, he is announced to the whole world. And notice as well that there will be a great trumpet sound. The trumpet that was used in those days was the shofar. I'm not going to try to. Well, I might try. The shofar. I have one here. I don't think I'm that great at trying to blow this. But what an amazing thing. Again, the earth will be shaken. The stars will begin to fall. In fact, it says rolled up like a scroll. And a great trumpet noise will announce his coming. A great trumpet noise, a procession to announce the king and kings and lord and lords. And as you see everything, if it wasn't enough, what will break through everything that is coming at you will be the noise much louder than this. But... That's puny compared to the noise that the entire earth will hear. And we find yet another comparison. Something else that's different. And I think it's almost more magnificent than the rest. Because the first coming, Jesus, the Messiah, came as a lamb, a sacrifice, and a man. The second coming, he is coming. He is going to come as King of kings and Lord of lords. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, it says all the angels, there is a procession coming with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. I have a few verses of Scripture here. Chapter 6, verse 16, again, calling to the mountains and rocks, talking about all the people of the earth. They're calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come. And again, who can stand? Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems crowns and he has a name written that no one knows but himself he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of god and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure were following him on white horses from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And if this description wasn't enough, I go to Revelation chapter 1. Just to get a close-up view of our Lord and Savior. Verse 12. 
Then I turned, this being John, being the John that loved Jesus the most, the John that was so close to him, the John that stayed with Christ, one of the only disciples, actually, if not the only one that stayed with him, and in the crucifixion was there as well, the John that arguably probably loved him the most. John, who should have of anybody recognized his Lord and Savior, the one whom his head rested on on a couch. He turned to see the voice that was speaking. And on turning, I, John, saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like the white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. And look what happens to John. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. John, the one that loved him the most, couldn't recognize Jesus. The one that loved him the most, again, he gives the description. He doesn't know what he's seeing, but he knows he's seeing the king. He falls on his face. He has no control of his body in the presence of God Almighty. The knee must bow. But, I love this, but Jesus laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. He gives a title. He says, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. This is Jesus. John sees the return of the king. He sees who Jesus now is. He saw him going and ascending to heaven as in the form of what looked to be a man, transcended. But now Jesus returns apparelled in great glory. Question is, will we recognize Jesus the Messiah? Is there times when we don't? See, we still see him as a man on earth a lot of times instead of the king he truly is and will return to be with us, again, adorned as he is in what we find chapter 1 and chapter 19 of Revelation. He also, when he returns as king, he's inheriting all things. The scroll, as we were reading in chapter 6, all of chapter 6 is talking about the seals that are going to be broken on a scroll in which Christ is going to be given. Chapter 5, if you want to go there with me, in verse 1, Then I saw in the right hand of him, who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back. Now, him is talking about God. In the chapter before this, we are talking about God himself in heaven. And he takes out this scroll. And written is so much information. It's not just within it, but it's also on the back. And it's sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or look into it. And John, I, began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion, the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. You know, there's actually some cultural significance in what this scroll really is. If you do a little bit of digging in his historical and cultural um, for, for Rome, you'll find that the readers in that time would know exactly what they were talking about. See, what would happen was a will and testament that would be written out for people. As you were rich, you could just go to the government office and it was signed and done. But a lot of people weren't that rich. They couldn't do it. 
there was another way of being able to write a will and testament. And the way to write that was that you would have the heir, the executor, and five witnesses. Seven people. See, you would have the executor, the person who is going to give the inheritance. You'd have the person who's going to receive the inheritance. And then you'd have five witnesses there. And each one had to have their signature, their seal, in which they would tie a rope around the scroll, and then they would seal down each of those pieces of string. What would happen later on, when it was time for the inheritance to finally be given and the will to be written, you had to have all those people present. And the notary had to be there and say, are these people present? And if they weren't, you can't open. You'll notice no one, no one but Christ could open this. What does that mean? Well, that purely means that he's the heir and the witness. See, nobody was there at the time of the will of the Father was written in the first and the beginning of ages. Only Christ was. Only Christ was there from the beginning. And therefore, he is the only one worthy of inheriting from his father, from God. See, when Christ comes as king of kings, it's because it is the time in which the inheritance has been given to him to rule over everything. That's why there's so much information on it. It says it's not just within the scroll itself, but it's on the backside of the scroll. And so when he comes... See, Jesus was born and lived as a man and sacrificed as a lamb. But when he returns, he will be king of kings in glory and to reign in what he has inherited from the Father. Continuing on, one of the last things that I noted going through here Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 again. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations, and He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on, the, on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry? and feed you, or thirsty, and, and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Friends, I'm, I'm, I, 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 when I read this, it's so clear. When we do the will of the Father, when we do in which He wants us to do, when we follow Christ as a disciples of Him, when He returns, He will say, I know you don't deserve it. I know you don't deserve it. But you're coming with me. I know... That you really didn't realize that the things in which you were doing for others and loving your neighbors wasn't exactly what you planned on serving me. But I'm telling you here, as Jesus told his disciples, and he's telling us through his word, that when we love our neighbors, we are loving him. When we love others, strangers, when we care and have compassion, as Christ did, we are doing his will. He does go further. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, 
into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Quick note, note, right here. Jesus seems to imply that hell was not intended for humans. When we talk about hell, which isn't a popular concept here, it's not a popular subject to be preached on anymore, but hell was not intended for the human spirit. It was intended for the angels, for the disobedient, for the devils. Again, people I've run into who gloat and glorify in the idea that they too, they'll, they'll go to hell and party there. They have no clue. They have no clue how terrible they really think. How warped the mind has to be to try to think that's going to be any sort of good time. But he goes further. For I was hungry and, I, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Revelations chapter 20, once again, getting close to the closing. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it from his presence, earth and sky, fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. And then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. We find that his first coming, he came as salvation, as a savior. His second coming, he comes as the judge of all the earth. The first coming was to save us from his second. That's what we find. We find when he first came, it was so that we had a way, the only way, but a way, for when the end of time comes, when he finally judges for our sins, that we have a way to stand that day. See, judgment will be for all. Well, our scripture here it tells us that. Christ tells us that. Judgment will be for all. It is only those who are clothed in his robes, those who call upon the name of the Lord that shall be saved, as we find in Romans 10, 13. Those who are written in the book of life. My question is, my question is for those of us here, is our name written in the book of life? Have we called upon the name of the Lord? There's coming a day where the King of kings and Lord of lords is coming, and what a glorious day it is for those who don't have to fear. And even then, we still have to fear. That's going to be a scary moment. I don't care who you are. <laughs> That's going to be a fearful moment when the entire universe shakes. When things we have never, ever, ever experienced will begin to come all at once. And then to see Christ himself in the way he is at the time of his coming. And how fearful he really will look. How glorious it will be to those who finally, as we find in Revelations, that we will sing praises in the fact that he has returned. Those who are not, though, there's going to be great torment and punishment. By the time he comes to judge, it'll be too late. See, every knee shall bow. And standing before an earthly judge, by the way, is a frightening thing by itself. I don't know who here has been in court ever. But 
even if it has nothing to do with crime and punishment, standing before a judge is a very scary thing, and that's a human court. I've stood before a judge a couple times. I don't, when the, the power for them to do whatever they want at that point is in their hands, that's a frightful thing. Can you imagine what it'll be like before the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the one who can take your soul and cast it to where, where you deserve? Who, and that's the question here. Remember in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 17, there's a question posed by the people who want to hide from the judge. It says, who can stand? The next chapter answers that. It's those sealed by the Messiah, Jesus, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. My question for uh, those who don't know Jesus today. Why not? He loves us. He, he died for us. The, first, the whole point of his first coming was to save us from, again, his second coming, which is to judge us from eternal damnation. What we deserve, and it'll only be Christ's blood, his robes, the seal of his Holy Spirit that separates us. And for those of us who do love the Lord, who do truly wait for his coming, let's be renewed in the fact that he is coming again, and when he comes, it's going to be a great and wonderful moment. Bow our heads in a word of prayer. Abba, I thank you just for how great you truly are. Lord, we are puny. Lord, we deserve, Lord, an eternity of hell. But, Lord, you gave us Christ. You gave us a Savior. And, Father, we look forward to the day. Those of us who truly love you and know you have a call upon the name of the Lord, our hearts do look for the day when you return. We look for the day when, God, you, when, the, when the entire universe will announce your coming. But, Father, help us to always be looking for that day. Help us to remember that this here is it going to amount to anything here on earth? And look forward towards you and your coming kingdom. And Lord, if we, again, look towards others and loving them and witnessing to them, ministering to them, serving them, Father, we give you glory and honor for it all. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you, guys.